Hello again, everybody. It's Lori White with the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce, and this is episode 186 of Chamber TV. And we are continuing our discussion uh, with the senior level business executives here in Rhode Island who are major employers and are very actively involved in the community and helping all of us collectively uh, make Rhode Island a better place to, to live, to work, to raise a family, to own a business, to be a valued employee in a business that's domiciled here in Rhode Island. So all good things. And I can't think of a, a more expert person to uh, bring forward today to share his views on government affairs and corporate social responsibility and the ESG movement then Rick Metters, and uh, Rick is Vice President of Regional Public Affairs for Fidelity Investments. Fidelity has a huge, huge presence in Rhode Island, major employer, and has a beautiful LEED certified campus uh, in Smithfield, Rhode Island, where it conducts business and uh, performs transactions, uh, not just regionally, but nationally, and is a very important hub to the entire Fidelity Investments uh, Network. So with that, let me say hello to Rick. How are you today? Great to have you with us. Thank you, Lori. Uh, great to be here. Um, humbled to represent Fidelity in the chamber, uh, serving as chair as its Government Affairs Committee. Absolutely. So uh, let's start, uh, Rick, just to, to level set and, and talk about Fidelity Investments and its um, tremendous presence here in Rhode Island. So how many employees do you have? And tell us a little bit about the kind of work and the impact that Fidelity makes uh, to our state. Sure. So uh, we've been fortunate to be in Rhode Island uh, at scale for now 25 years. Uh, we're located in Smithfield off of uh, the Douglas Pike, right across from Bryant University uh, on a 550 acre campus. Um, we do have uh, LEED certified facilities on campus, as you know, Lori, appreciate you uh, mentioning that. Uh, I, I recall that uh, just as the pandemic was starting in earnest, that I gave you a call to notify you that Fidelity was going remote. At that point, I believe it was 3,300 associates that were literally in the next day going to be working remotely. Uh, little did we know how long we were going to be working and, and certainly didn't anticipate uh, the scale and, and the length of that time. But uh, from that 3,300 in March of 2020, uh, as I speak to you today, we now have over 4,500 associates in our Smithfield campus. So significant growth. Uh, a, a great deal of that growth is attributed to the fact that uh, in March of 2021, uh, we announced with Governor McKee and other state officials that we would be adding a personal investments or retail uh, customer uh, care center at our campus. And that has been a, a huge driver of growth for us. In addition, uh, we have a, a large contingent of institutional investors um, that we service out of that campus. So it could be intermediaries, advisors, et cetera, as well as our workplace investing group uh, that provides 401k and other workplace services for companies large and small across the company. So all in total, they're actually among those 4,500 associates, we represent 26 individual businesses for Fidelity uh, in the Smithfield campus. One of the best uh, aspects of uh, the Fidelity story and, and one that um, I know that you, you too are proud of, Rick, is that the jobs that we're talking about are jobs that essentially span the spectrum, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, these are not just elite positions, although we are fortunate to have a number of, you know, very senior executives um, from Fidelity sitting here in Rhode Island. But I know part of the, the, the aspect of the business that you're really proud of is the availability of these jobs um, to, you know, newly graduated um, college students or students coming out of various specialty training programs and um, the ability that they have to engage uh, sort of at an entry level position with Fidelity and to be able to um, gain the skills and the training and learn the culture of Fidelity for um, the ability to, you know, to have a career long into the future. 
I think it's a, a astute observation, Lori, that you know, in pre-pandemic, um, our Smithfield campus within the Fidelity universe was a highly tenured site, um, which you know certainly has benefits. However, in adding that regional center, we added at scale uh, really a, a very wide on-ramp into Fidelity for, for literally hundreds. I think we're now 850 associates in that group uh, and growing. So, you know, it provides an entry level opportunity that candidly didn't exist uh, in, in that site and in the state for Fidelity. And, and these are the kind of jobs that to your point um, can sustain an individual you can build a family with, you can buy a home with, with these kind of roles. And, uh, you know, it also, I think, makes us more acutely aware of the needs of, of the state on a larger scale, particularly higher education, secondary education, and, and the need for more robust training uh, and job training and development programs as well. That's a perfect segue to um, the raison d'etre of this interview, which is to really um, have a conversation with you, Rick, as the chair of our government affairs committee at the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and in that role, um, you and a number of um, other volunteers and leaders from the business community uh, work with us at the chamber to help um, put together an agenda, a legislative agenda um, that helps to position Rhode Island uh, truly as a good place, a good economic environment, a good environment from a, a regulatory perspective. So um, first of all, thank you for all the time and energy and uh, uh, input that you provide to the group. You're a, you're a fantastic leader. And I, I know that uh, I speak on behalf of uh, our board chair, Megan Hughes, and also our staff and, and the rest of the board in, in thanking you for uh, your attention to detail and your interest um, in these matters. So having said that, um, you know, tell us a little bit about um, why you were interested in, in really connecting the themes coming out of our government affairs agenda with the overall business climate. What, uh, what, uh, what led you to raise your hand and step forward? Well, I think number one is indeed an honor to, to, to be chair of that group. Uh, and, and I also, uh, uh, our personal professional level had the opportunity to succeed John Mudridge, who was my predecessor in the role as Vice President of Regional Public Affairs at Fidelity, and uh, you know, someone who is a, a, a friend and mentor of mine. Uh, we are both fortunate. We are the only two people to ever occupy that role at Fidelity Investments. But I think more importantly, uh, working with the Government Affairs Committee, we were literally talking about dozens of outstanding professionals representing companies large and small from all parts of the state. Um, not simply Providence, uh, who, who believe that, that business is a force for good and that we are common stakeholders in the fate of our state. Um, in addition, they bring a wealth of knowledge, experience, and expertise in a wide variety of disciplines, whether it be legal, HR, regulatory, finance, higher ed, uh, nonprofit work, et cetera. And, and I think that uh, we understand that, that the business community, and particularly the chamber, um, is inextricably linked to the tapestry of our state and that uh, we have a role and indeed a responsibility uh, to, to set forth what we believe in um, and, and demonstrate leadership whenever possible. Um, I think it's also fair to say that in the last couple of years, we've moved the chamber a bit. There has been a purposeful uh, shift in dynamic that uh, previously we tended to look at our legislative work our government affairs work is more of an agenda and, and a bit of a laundry list in terms of the, the items that more often than not, we were more on defense and more negative candidly, things we didn't want to see happen. And I think we've we've tried to flip that script and uh, we have now a set of legislative principles which guide our work. And, and they really focus on what you had mentioned, Lori, that, that we want Rhode Island to be uh, a premier state for private sector job growth. We want the state to be a great place to live, work, and raise a family. And uh, we see our work is linked to all of those pillars. So give us um, give us a tangible, concrete example of, um, you know, how, demonstrating how we may have um, flipped the agenda from 
sort of defensive to offensive um, from, you know, the theory of no, this can't happen to the theory of yes, we can work together and advance these principles. And, and I think um, it's fair to say, and it's a tribute to you and the entire government affairs committee and to John Muggeridge and other chamber leaders um, that have come before us in the last you know, couple of years that the business community's relationship with the General Assembly has really turned to be quite a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, lots of strong collaboration, lots of receptivity to the views of business and an appreciation for you know, being able to have um, you know, laws, provisions on the books that that are not overly burdensome to business. So that in itself represents a major shift. And along with that, um, you know, coincidentally is the opportunity to, um, you know, to push forward with certain issues in a, in a more, you know, positive and hopeful, optimistic light. I think one, one of the issues that might seem to be a bit counterintuitive to folks when you think of a business uh, group like, like ours, is our focus on on education. And I think of the work not only of our, our chamber board, but of uh, Chris Graham and the Education Committee. Um, they have been partners uh, with thought leaders, um, with experts in the field like the Annenberg Institute of Brown, uh, working side by side with RIDE, Brown Department of Education, the Providence Public Schools, um, looking for creative solutions to problems that I think we all face. For example, I think talent is, is one of those key areas, you know, certainly that all of us, whether we are a large concern or a small business, are feeling most acutely now. And the education team at the chamber has been working with those partners in identifying pipelines of talent um, and looking at not only the next generation, but, but current workforce and, and how we can deepen and diversify it. Um, and so the work of the education group dovetails what we're doing in government affairs as well. Um, that's one example where we can put a stake in the ground and say we are all stakeholders um, in terms of ensuring that that uh, young people uh, receive the type of instruction, that they have uh, warm, safe, dry schools as well, that the physical facilities are uh, inspiring and vibrant and safe, um, and ensuring that there's a continuum from pre-K um, and child, robust child care all the way through to higher ed, a, a sector that we've traditionally underinvested in. And so, I, you know, we work in partnership. We don't do this work alone. Um, and I think we are, we are always looking for, for positive collaborators, uh, whether they be in the legislature, whether they be nonprofit organizations, higher ed, um, other business groups uh, and others. Uh, to put forward a, you know, a common vision and common goal. I think there is significant alignment in, in many respects. Um, and I think we go into the, those uh, conversations uh, with humility, um, a willingness to listen, but at all times are focused on positive creative solutions and problem solving. Yeah, I think you, um, you, you really uh, crystallize that beautifully. And among the issues um, that we continue to talk about on a regular basis is um, the ability to put forth a competitive tax climate. And we do that because it really um, is the underpinning element around um, job creation. So we don't want to be at the top of the pack and we don't want to be at the bottom of the heap in terms of um, having tax policy that that represents an outlier, if you will, particularly um, in, you know, with our New England neighbors. So talk a little bit about um, you know, why that's important and how, you know, how it really dovetails with the ability for an economy to create jobs, to create good jobs, and also to generate a positive impact so that our communities um, have the resources that they need to provide vital services, you know, like schools and public safety. Well, I think, you know, I would start with, we have to give credit where credit is due, that, that the kind of conversations we've had the last two years, um, for the most part, have been focusing on how we can target tax relief. So I, I do appreciate the work of the governor and the legislature in targeting some of the most egregious um, or most negatively impactful taxes. You think about the, the multi-year effort to eliminate the car tax is one example that you know nearly every Rhode Islander faces. 
And I think if we can take that mentality and, and, and continue it, um, we'll all benefit. Um, you know, there was tax relief. When we're talking about how we provide tax relief as opposed to how and where with whom we raise taxes, I think that's a, a, a stronger conversation. Um, the governor's state of the state budget, I think, at least continues that theme. Um, you know, to your point about competitiveness, we know that in Massachusetts, uh, they instituted the so-called millionaire's tax. Uh, that may give us a unique opportunity to differentiate the, the two states. And I think we're realistic enough to know that, you know, we, we don't anticipate a, a rampage from Seekonk to East Providence anytime soon. But, you know, I would think if you're an entrepreneur looking to start a business in Attleboro, and you can do it then in Pawtucket and still serve the same market, but potentially keep more of those dollars, invest more in your business, grow more, grow quicker. Um, I think there's there, there could be some something compelling there, and, and we'd like to leverage that. Um, in addition, the governor mentioned about reducing the sales tax to be more competitive with both Connecticut and Massachusetts. Um, I think those are the kinds of steps that we would like to see. Um, perhaps you can, you know, think about some of the other uh, more egregious forms of taxation on business, um, such as the tangible property tax uh, and others. And, and, you know, once again, the good thing I think is that we're at a point in time where we can have a productive, constructive conversation about these topics. Um, and actually talk about reducing the tax burden to spur additional growth um, and create additional opportunity uh, as opposed to figuring out, you know, from which pocket uh, additional dollars are going to come. So I, I think we're, you know, a unique sort of historical moment in that regard. Uh, we've been very fortunate these last two years that the, the terms of debate have kind of shifted in a, in a positive area. Um, at the same time, I think you know, we, we can't assume that that the robust revenues that we've had are going to continue. Um, certainly appreciate what Speaker Karchi has said, that for those who, who looked at perhaps the, the November revenue numbers and said, oh, my gosh, we're going to $600 billion surplus. The Speaker has been very clear. Let's not even use the surplus language. Yes, revenues are ahead of expenditures. Yes, we would certainly prefer that to the alternative. However, we really need to wait until May uh, to determine whether or not there actually are surplus dollars and, and how and if that happens, how we can move forward to to invest those dollars. And, um, you know, the taxation piece is inextricably linked to the, 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 the uh, government expenditures as well. And, and much like we did last year when we knew that there were unprecedented resources coming from D.C., we would ask the legislature to keep an investor long term mindset that you would one time dollars, there's one time expenditures and to avoid uh, increased spending that would have a significant long term uh, costs and legacy costs that, that may not be manageable if the economy um, were, to, were to move downward. So uh, I think we're in an advantageous place. And I do think we're, we're in a place where uh, because we do have some some uh, positive revenue for, for the moment, and, and we are talking about the right kind of conversations that that we'll be able to be able to move forward productively and collaboratively. I think what you're describing, Rick, is you know all can go under the the overarching theme of uh, spending government funds wisely, mm -hmm. uh, particularly those those dollars that did come in from DC in the aftermath of, of the pandemic, also to um, you know, help meet unemployment insurance claims and right. other stresses on the local economy and on local government. And I think the other point, Lori, you know, last year there was $100 million uh, invested in the unemployment uh, insurance fund. I think that's another great area for additional investment if we do have those kind of dollars uh, that has a direct impact on businesses, large and small, and their bottom lines, it also protect work protects workers as well. So I know it's something that labor's had a strong interest in. I think that's an area where we could continue to collaborate. The other thing I would I would suggest that we may want to consider would be if we do have additional dollars, uh, it would be an opportunity to increase the state's rainy day fund as well uh, to ensure that essential state services are provided if there is an economic downturn as well. 
So we've uh, talked about some broad themes. We've talked about um, nurturing a positive business climate. We've talked about investing in our children. We've talked about spending um, funds, government funds wisely. Um, we've talked about, you know, other aspects of, you know, a competitive um, tax formula, if you will. Um, but another of the areas that um, we're really excited about, and it's somewhat of a, a new foray for us, is you know the entree into the blue and green economy, and really being um, an agent and a force and uh, an organization that really points to and and champions the opportunities that are available, um, you know, particularly in the ocean economy and partnering with the University of Rhode Island and with some of our other um, educational institutions, including the Community College of Rhode Island. So thinking about how our oceans, our waterways can really create job opportunities and economic output for our state. So that's, you know, that is a really important element of our legislative uh, principles. How do you, how do you see that um, you know, unfolding in the course of the next 12 months? Well, I, I think that Rhode Island in particular, as the ocean state, is, is uniquely positioned uh, to move forward with the blue and green economy. Uh, we were the first state to employ offshore wind at scale. Uh, we have hundreds of miles of coastline. We have a well-established infrastructure regarding uh, defense industry here. But there's also aquaculture and other innovative technologies. Uh, that we can employ. Uh, we also are fortunate to have an outstanding research institution in the University of Rhode Island. Uh, and I think that th there's another area where we've seen, you know, a growing consensus. Uh, the state's voters uh, voted on a bond to expand and uh, develop the Narragansett Bay campus for the University of Rhode Island. So it's not simply uh, a, a small group of people uh, that, that have thought about this and, and, and believe that it's worth investing in. Uh, I think there is uh, a, a tremendous opportunity to leverage unique uh, skills and qualifications of, of the folks that we have in this state and position Rhode Island to be at the forefront of the blue and green economies as well, uh, that you can do well uh, financially and do well by the planet as well as it is a great place to be literally and figuratively. Um, and I think that the chamber will be spending a lot more time moving forward to find ways that you can um, look for a multiple bottom line uh, for, for, you know, for the people of the state, uh, improving our environment, uh, strengthening our bottom line, providing opportunities for uh, Rhode Islanders to, to have jobs that they can grow and live on and, and, and grow a family with and, and contribute back to the community with as well. So looking forward to where we can be very strategic and targeted uh, with those investments and, and work collaboratively with state, local, and federal government entities as well um, to, to ensure that um, Rhode Island's at the forefront when it comes to the blue and green technologies of not, not just the future, but, but the emerging today. Yes, so you're referring to um, the business communities um, efforts around ESG, so environment, social, and governance. And um, what is new on that front is the business community writ large coming together. And really, um, many of our larger institutional investors, companies are, you know, very experienced and very much uh, immersed in ESG strategies within their own enterprises and Fidelity is an excellent example of a company that has had that at the top of its agenda for many, many years. Um, so we're talking about, you know, really collectively getting everyone on that page and understanding, you know, what we can do by working together, just, you know, businesses together along with other organizations and really mobilizing the population to to think about ways in which we can uh, not just treat the planet better, but also provide um, more just opportunities um, for our workers and to be able to you know, respond to the major themes of today, which, which is essentially that you know, employees really wanna work um, for an employer or for a company or for an organization that is committed to something larger than themselves, which has a purpose and 
really um, has has a has a point of view that um, is is beyond just you know the everyday bottom line. And you you know you've demonstrated that, and I think you've brought these themes into our messaging, our collective messaging, and the blue and green economy is is a perfect example of that. And you may have some other examples as well. Yeah, I guess I think of it less in terms of ideology than I think in terms of the spirit of inclusion, that uh, we want uh, to provide opportunities for everyone across the state. Um, we, we don't want to leave folks behind. Uh, and candidly, I don't think you know, we're a small enough state that we can't leave anyone behind, uh, particularly if we want to make it a premier state um, for, for private sector growth. Uh, it, we, we need to, to tap in to the, the talents and potential of all of our residents. Uh, in every, uh, every one of the 39 cities and towns of the state, in all of its neighborhoods, uh, whether or not you're a multi-generation Rhode Islander or a first-generation Rhode Islander. So, uh, you know, I look at it in very practical terms about how we can, uh, the rising tide can lift all boats. And, you know, I, I see it through, a, you know, like I say, less an ideological lens than just simply a, a, a common sense, a good, good faith, good neighbor lens. You know, how can we help one another? And, uh, you know, I, I do look at it in terms of uh, a, a bottom line that's robust for all. One of the uh, other issues that we get a lot of, um, you know, discussion and feedback about are, um, you know, is the issue of, you know, workplace regulations. And, you know, one of the things that comes to mind, um, you know, most directly is the, um, you know, being able to put forth and to maintain a, a drug-free workplace. And, that of course goes towards you know management, labor relations, and the ability um, for the two sides to really um, you know have an open and constructive way of, of looking at what happens in the workplace. So workplace rules and regulations very important to employers, right? Absolutely, I think it's it's you know for us you know we've seen very well intentioned legislation pass um, that can sometimes. Um, create burdens that are unanticipated, unexpected, and uh, really provide uh, a disincentive to, to grow a business here. Um, and I think what we really need to do is if we can strengthen the dialogue between policymakers, legislators, and the business community, um, ideally on the front end, um, we can achieve similar uh, goals, similar aims, uh, create social good, but do so in a way that allows businesses to thrive uh, and rather than stumble. And I think um, all, all too often um, the, the good intentions uh, manifest themselves in ways that, that make it challenging uh, as opposed to invigorating. And I think that uh, it's incumbent on all of us to, to ensure that there's a two-way dialogue. I, I know that both Senate President Ruggiero and and, said, uh, and House Speaker Shikarchi have been very clear uh, they that they want and need um, active participation, active engagement from the business community in those conversations to avoid situations where um, they they inadvertently create uh, burdensome regulation and uh, sometimes defy common sense. Well, the shorthand that's been applied to that whole theory is if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And I know that's a famous expression in uh, political law going back uh, centuries or at least decades. Uh, but Speaker Shikarchi did, did bring that out and uh, revive that as a maxim. Uh, and of course, we're, we're using that in our own materials. So explain a little bit of uh, you know, what that's about. Uh, you know, I think it's really you know, creating relationships uh, with the business community and legislators, I think there is a sincere interest among uh, the, the governor and the legislative leadership to understand the needs of businesses, large and small, uh, is a responsibility of us to ensure that our issues are brought to their attention, that they gain an understanding of, of our pain points particularly, um, but also our, our, our share of successes and, and, and best practices as well, so we can look to replicate uh, those. Um, in our case, on a practical basis, it means being in the state house more, uh, engaging our, our elected officials more frequently, uh, to truly have a working relationship with them, uh, so they know us, we know them, 
and, and I always say that I, I hate for my first interaction with anyone to be an ask. So I think we, we're trying to focus on creating relationships first and then tasks later. Uh, and doing so, we're doing some innovative things this year uh, with our government affairs committee, including a, a legislative reception at the state house, making it easy for, for both uh, folks in the business community and legislators to interact. Uh, we, of course, will be hosting our annual legislative luncheon in which hundreds of business leaders from across the state uh, will, will participate in the leadership bipartisan, bicameral. Uh, we'll, we'll get to uh, talk with you, Lori, and I know we're all uh, look forward to that. It's a, a key point of our calendar. And uh, we're very fortunate that we have uh, excellent uh, folks working with us uh, in, in the State House as well, and Bob Goldberg and Kara Cromwell, um, who also are able to articulate our message and understand the, the principles that we've just discussed. Absolutely. And um, we have, as you mentioned, uh, a full array of activities. And, and that's really what the task is all about uh, today in 2023. That's really uh, a very important role that organizations like Chambers of Commerce, not just here in Rhode Island, but all across the country, play in interacting um, with lawmakers, both on the state and federal, and, you know, for that matter, on the local level as well. There are so many different issues and activist groups out there that, you know, it's really important to be able to come and assist the legislators um, by providing information that's good quality information that they can use and that they can make um, sensible uh, decisions with. So we only have a minute left, um, Rick. So I wanna ask you um, if folks are listening to this uh, interview and they're interested to know more about the Chamber's legislative principles um, how can they learn more and how can they potentially get involved? Well, they can certainly go to the Providence Chamber website. We have uh, our legislative principles up there. We have ways to get involved, uh, ways to support, whether it's in person or perhaps, you know, we do have a, a chamber uh, pack as well. Uh, I, I would say we also have our, our meetings among our membership are, are open and available uh, to people to participate in. And I think, you know, what they absolutely can do on a, on a regular and ongoing basis is engage with policymakers, representatives in their own communities. Um, they possess, I would say, an authentic and powerful voice and uh, would urge them to, to uh, be active as opposed to passive and uh, create a, you know, a, a, a wider perspective and a positive perspective of what we collectively are trying to do uh, across the state. Well, you summarized that um, beautifully, Rick, and we all can aspire to, um, you know, watching your excellent example and emulating the work that you do and also um, the example and the perspective of Fidelity Investments and in wanting to um, be excellent corporate citizens and bringing, you know, that feeling, those feelings and those perspectives and those resources to bear in a very visible and constructive way. So thank you, Rick, for everything you do for the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce. We love working with you. Thank you, Laurie. It's mutual. I uh, appreciate your, your leadership and uh, the guidance and, and support you provide all of us. Thank you. All right. Well, I hope you'll, uh, you'll come back. We'll do another uh, episode of Chamber TV as we progress through the legislative session, and we'll talk about some of the key themes that are emerging at that at that time. But for now, um, we will see you all later. And thanks everybody for watching. Take good care.